Ink Ribbon. After going through some rocky moments, Resident Evil resurfaced as an entirely new experience in Resident Evil 7. Capcom used this opportunity to use new development methods to create a unique experience and bring the series back to its survival horror roots, and it became an instant hit. Before I get into the video, I have to mention that certain scenes may be censored because I have had a few videos demonetized due to blood and gore, so just throwing that out there. And without further delay, here is my list of the top 10 secrets and easter eggs in Resident Evil 7. Number 10. Meaty Enemies. Modern games are a whole new world for most developers, and this goes double when going for realism. For this game, a relatively new method of 3D called photogrammetry was used for almost every aspect of the game, which I will get to later in the video. But if you're wondering how they got the mold monsters, decaying bodies, and home-cooked meal to look so... Uh, real? Well, the answer is simple. Most of it was real. Capcom took a happy little field trip to a meat processing plant where they took meat and scanned it for the game's textures. This included normal meat, old meat, and rotten meat. Alongside this, they took scans of organs from dead animals and may possibly be where the opening sequence of the decaying dog came from. Number 9 Severed Leg we all know that part in the game when Ethan gets his hand cut off, right? Well, there's another similar sequence that is kind of a rare occurrence, so I thought I'd mention it. I only thought Jack could do it, but while capturing footage I discovered that he can do it in different ways using either a shovel or a chainsaw, and the molded can cut off your leg as well. The chance that this will happen seems to be random and rare, but the good news is it's not game over. Just crawl over and pick up your leg and Ethan should be able to reattach it if you have a healing item. Just like real life. Number 8 Name Change So, in some countries the franchise is known as Resident Evil, and in others it's known as Biohazard. The main reason for this was due to a DOS game called Biohazard, or better known as Biomenace, as well as an up-and-coming New York band also called Biohazard. Not to mention the fact that you can't trademark a single word in the US. So, there was a contest held at Capcom to come up with a new name and Resident Evil 1. Well, apparently, during production of Resident Evil 7, the executives thought that since the game was sort of being reborn as a completely new experience, this would be a great time to permanently call the series Biohazard across all regions and unify the game's name. The marketing department did everything they could to convince them not to do that, so a compromise was made. In Japan, the game was given Resident Evil as a subtitle, and in the other regions, the game was given the subtitle Biohazard. And it worked beautifully, especially given the use of incorporating the number into each logo. Number 7 Sweet Home Homage Do you recognize this game? This is Sweet Home for the NES, and it is the game that inspired Resident Evil. Based on a Japanese horror movie of the same name, you play as five filmmakers who search a mansion while encountering ghosts and other spooky things. You can see where I'm going with this. In the beginning of Resident Evil 7, you play as a group of filmmakers going into an old house and encountering some... Well, I don't think spooky is a strong enough word in this case, but you get the picture. It's a great nod to the original inspiration that can easily go over people's heads and is definitely worth a mention. Number 6 Out of Bounds Shout out to the YouTube channel Slippy Slides for this one, but in Resident Evil 7 you can actually get out of bounds and explore the outside of the map relatively easy if you want to. The best place to do this is in the main hall of the second house, specifically at this railing right here. When Jack is chasing you, stand here and wait for him to grab you from behind. It may take a few tries, but if successful, he will push Ethan through the wall, leaving you free to explore places you weren't supposed to be in. Number 5 Resident Evil References While this game may seem far derived from the rest of the Resident Evil franchise, it actually is filled to the brim with small nods and references to other games in the series. You know the title card of each videotape? Well at first it may seem like there are random number codes on the screen as they start, but they are actually partial product IDs for Resident Evil Director's Cut, 
Resident Evil 2, and Resident Evil 3, depending on which tape you're viewing. In the Baker's home, you can find a book titled The Unveiled Abyss, written by Clive O'Brien, who was head of security for the BSAA in Revelations. Also in the Baker's home is a framed photo of the Arklay Mountains, where the first game took place. In the main hall of the Baker home is a newspaper with an article written by Alyssa Ashcroft from Resident Evil Outbreak, and is the only Outbreak character to be confirmed to have survived Raccoon City. Now stepping outside of the Baker home, if you look up, you can spot a window that looks like half of the Umbrella logo. In all honesty, this could just be a coincidence, since this type of window is a pretty common one in this type of housing design, but I'm sure the developers were aware of the resemblance. Later in the game, you can find a magazine with a news story about Raccoon City and how its survivors are still suffering. The bombing of Raccoon City is something I want to make an entire video about, but for now we'll just take this as a nod to Resident Evil 3. And the last, and probably most obvious nod, is the gun you get at the end of the game called Albert 01, which is a powerful gun that can also be unlocked in several game modes and refers to Albert Wesker. It also carries the star's insignia on the slide and grips. Number 4 Development Process As I mentioned before, the development process was a huge undertaking for the staff and introduced a lot of new technology and techniques. One of them was photogrammetry, which is basically using cameras to do a 3D scan of an object or a person. That's what's being done anytime you see actors in those weird light ball things with a skin cap on. Anyway, aside from the graphics, the developers focused very intently on the experience that the player would feel and created this early build of the game in Unity to see what worked and what didn't. Instead of driving, the main character would have been in a taxi. If you've ever wondered what games look like while in early development, this is it. Gorgeous. Also, Jack looks as though his head might have slightly come off or something if you shot him, but it's hard to tell. They also used live reference of acted out scenes to make sure that they got the details right. There also seems to be a much bigger open area with a sort of mini corn maze that led to Zoe's trailer. Zoe looked much more thin and frail, but it could just be an early model. And here you can start to see the elements come together visually with the help of better models, 3D scans, and the power of the RE engine. And one last thing to mention, this game was not in any way inspired by PT or Silent Hills. It was actually in development long before PT was ever released. Number 3 Baker Family During the early builds of the game, and specifically the beginning hour demo that was released, you would occasionally see a ghost girl who would quickly disappear and scared a lot of gamers, but in the final build of the game she was nowhere to be found. Well, if you look at this early concept art, you can see that she was included as a member of the Baker Family and simply called Daughter, most likely a precursor to Zoe. Aside from different designs for all the family members, there were some cut characters such as Servant, two twins, and a dog. While none of the others are found, you can see the ghost of the daughter in seven different locations within the demo of the game. It's also believed that the dog decomposing at the opening is the Baker's family dog, but there's no proof that I could find to back that up. Number 2 Cut Content just like any other game, Resident Evil 7 has some cut content, but thankfully most of it is negligible. One thing that is worth noting is that originally the game was going to be completely action focused following the examples of Resident Evil 6, but thanks to Jun Takeuchi, one of the producers for Resident Evil 7, he convinced them to refine the game and focus more on horror, which, thankfully, they did. Their main inspiration for the entire setting was actually the 1981 film The Evil Dead, which led the producers not only to scale back the game to one central location, but also make the game a first-person experience. The part of the game where Ethan gets his hand cut off was actually much more dark and gory, having Ethan actually cut in half at the waist and having to crawl to his lower half as his guts drag on the floor behind him. But the overwhelming feedback told the producers that this was a bit excessive. There were also zombies in the game, but they were unique in that they reacted to the player's breathing. This utilized a mechanic where you would have to hold your breath around them to avoid being detected, but the developers decided to scrap the idea, even though some zombies were made for the game. And lastly were these character renders that you were seeing. These were shown so early in development that they might just be test examples of what their technology could do, but some people think these might be early versions of Mia, 
Ethan, and others that went unused or were changed later on. I'm gonna guess these were part of some type of technical demo, so take them with a grain of salt. Number 1 Redfield Okay, so we need to talk about Mr. Redfield. At the end of the game, a man appears in an umbrella uniform and introduces him as Redfield in the middle of a boss battle, no less. It was a lot thrown at you at once and created a bit of confusion among fans, myself included, so I thought I'd help break things down and explain. This is going to get a little complicated, and I apologize, but just hear me out. First of all, this is Chris Redfield. He's even credited as Chris in the credits. The main reason so many people didn't think it was him was that he looks nothing like Chris, which is understandable. So why does Chris look so different? Well, it's the same reason he looked different in Resident Evil 5. I'm sure we all remember that at one point, Chris looked like this, and then suddenly looked like this. So this isn't the first time they've changed him. As I mentioned several times, it all comes down to their new photogrammetry technology. Just like the new Leon and Claire in Resident Evil 2 Remake, all the characters in Resident Evil 7 are scans of real people, and Resident Evil 5 Chris is a stylized hybrid of a real person and a concept. This is just the future of gaming, and as for why they chose this specific model to be the new Chris, I have no idea, but that was Capcom's choice. Okay, next is the fact that he arrives in an umbrella helicopter. Blue Umbrella specifically, which has never been mentioned in the series till now, and it was a little confusing to understand, but I think I get it now. Basically, Blue Umbrella is a giant PR campaign to gain the public's trust back. In the game, you find a document titled Letter Regarding Umbrella's Goals, and it gives you a brief glimpse into what it is, stating that they will put a stop to all bioweapons, which is confusing for fans since Umbrella is known for being bioweapons are us. So after the bombing of Raccoon City, which killed hundreds of thousands of people, the government created new policies to shift blame to Umbrella. Congress shut them down, and a class action lawsuit was filed against them. During all this, those mysterious executives who owned Umbrella were finally caught and arrested. Still with me? Okay, so now Umbrella wants to come back and show people that they aren't the big evil company that people thought they were and are vowing to stop and destroy all BOW experiments and deploy private military groups, like the guys in Resident Evil 3, except they're actually good guys. Due to the government restrictions placed on Umbrella, they aren't allowed to send Blue Umbrella employees, so instead they hire people like the BSAA to prevent conflict of interest, and that is why Chris is involved. So to sum it up, Blue Umbrella is the new Umbrella which is trying to be good instead of evil, and they hired Chris to help them. I hope they explain this more in Resident Evil 8 because this is a really interesting turn of events that I actually didn't even know about until I started researching this video, but we will have to wait and see. And for now, this is my list for the seventh entry into the series. If I missed anything or if anyone has some good cures for the horrible VR sickness this game gives me, let me know in the comments or find me on Twitter at InkRibbonGames. My channel has gotten so many subscribers in the past few weeks and I've been getting so many nice comments and messages from people and I just want to say thank you, you guys are so awesome. I'm Kai Morgan and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to my bronze, silver, and gold Patreon supporters. Thanks to you, I can make videos without worrying about demonetization and grow my channel faster.